Okay. So welcome everyone. We're here today with an audience in real life. You might know about this uh, because you joined the meetup. We're trying to do a live stream. Let's see if it works. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to the speaker who will present on Golang Go GRPC today. All right, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. It's quite an honor. I think this has been in the making a very, very long time. Uh, Robert and me, we talked about eight months ago uh, to get this thing started again. And uh, what an honor to see so many uh, gophers. Um, later, I will be curious how many really use Golang in their everyday life, um, but uh, it, I'm very excited and looking forward for the discussions afterwards. Uh, this talk is uh, more introductory, so a kind of um, introduction to Golang and gRPC. What kind of problem would gRPC solve that uh, maybe REST APIs don't solve? What kind of advantages do we have? And um, I will show you some kind of example application where we make use of the features of uh, gRPC and that it gives us. And yeah, and then. Hopefully we can have some kind of conversation about it if it mis if this makes sense or not. Um, yeah, so just a few introductory notes. Um, gRPC. So what does RPC stand for? Everybody knows, I guess, uh, remote procedure calls. And the gRPC is just a nested acronym. So the G in gRPC stands for gRPC, of course. Um, Modern Communication Foundation, 2015, and governed by the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation. So what are the benefits of it or the benefits it promises? Simplicity of communication across applications and performance of uh, binary serialized messages uh, versus JSON. So usually when we build uh, web applications, the go-to serialization method is JSON and everybody can read it. It's human readable. You can look what kind of communication is going on in any uh, web browser. This kind of um, ability is sort of uh, lost, but sort of not. And uh, we will take a look into that as well. So first of all, um, a journey through the history of HTTP. Um, how did everything start and what does uh, gRPC use? gRP uses um, HTTP2. How do we get there? So first of all, we have HTTP1 um, back in the days. Uh, what does it mean? So we have the start of a TCP connection and the end of a TCP connection with every request. Um, you can see here some horizontal lines. You just say, I start a TCP, I make a request, I get an answer and the TCP connection stops. And then if I want to make another request, I have to start another TCP uh, connection up between the client and the server. So this has been uh, improved with HTTP 1.1 and uh, WebSockets kind of keeping alive the CTCP connection, reducing the congestion, network traffic, and so on. So now suddenly we can have um, multiple connections for parallel services. We can have basically um, multiple messages coming in and sending us uh, updates, callbacks, and so on. And what's this the improvement on that in HTTP 2? In HTTP2, we can now have multiple streams open all the time. So one of the problems that a lot of times uh, people have with REST API is if you query big chunks of data, you kind of start to introduce pagination, right? So you have uh, page one, the first 100 results, and then I would like to query the next 100 pages. So I start the next query, next TCP connection. Um, however, how nice would it be if you could keep alive this connection and then just say, okay, and now give me the next 100. And by the way, I would like to have multiple different streams which run in parallel as well and uh, can do that. So there have been a lot of solutions for this for WebSocket as well. For example, Socket.io uses namespaces where it tries to separate these kind of things on, on other bases. However, HTTP2 um, gives us the ability and gRPC uses HTTP2 HTTP to actually then have real multiple uh, streams running in parallel with each other. So let's look at some example setup. Um, maybe you write some kind of web application in any language you like, uh, Python, Golang, or Java, and you have some kind of front-end application. Now, if you develop something with microservices in the backend where they also have to communicate with each other, with each other you will have to implement uh, some kind of library. Right in Python, we have requests in Golang Net HTTP, and in Java, we have HTTP or connection where you have your own class or library or struct type, and then you have to implement the connection with each other. And all of them look very different to each, to each other. Maybe they also implement a little bit of different things. 
And you basically have to have control over the HTTP connection yourself when you implement those. Um, so each programming language has their own client library, and it makes it quite hard maybe across teams to communicate all this and set it up. And um, so with REST, we would use an HTTP one and communicate with all of these libraries and send data across the network. Um, so what is it with REST? So we use TCP connection per request. Um, many functions do not you, uh, fit the RESTful paradigm. So if you only talk about resources sharing, you know, um, the typical example is you have a database, you have uh, many persons in the database, and then person slash ID, you get a certain person. Uh, maybe ID slash something else, you get a certain property of the person. So it, it works maybe nice for resources. However, if you want to do something that changes the state of your server or send some kind of restart request and so on, now you get into the discussion with the rest of the team, maybe rest of the company, how should the endpoint actually look like? You know, like we have now some action that follows something, maybe it's very specific to the use case. Um, and then you are stuck with it for, for some time. So it doesn't really fit the, the rest for use case. On the other hand as well, here you don't have a bi-directional streaming. So you are restricted to your TCP connections and you cannot combine many resources. And um, it's quite an unpopular work uh, to write client libraries. So whatever you connect to, it has some kind of API definition already. Um, this is something that can be argued because with Swag and um, OpenAPI, you can generate a lot of these client libraries already. However, there is still some functionality missing in, in REST APIs. So how could we improve with this? And what would we like to maybe trade or lose to gain something else? Um, what is good with REST API is that everything is very readable. You can use Postman. Everybody understands what kind of packages you send and get back. Um, pretty easy to, to understand that. Um, however, maybe it's fine to trade these things to get some performance out. Maybe if you have uh, backend services, it's not necessary to have it in a human readable style. Anyways, it's machines communicating with each other. A human will never see these packages. And if we have to debug it, we will have tools to see the data anyways, or some logging. So maybe it's fine to actually trade it, um, the human readability against performance. What can we do? Um, so the suggestion of gRPC is to have some kind of um, gRPC layer built in, uh, something that we can generate. And the gray layer there would be something like protobuf maybe and if we can somehow define our api and we can generate all these libraries that take care for us about the http connection and the communication for all of this it would simplify the work for for all of us afterwards so what does this do um we can actually uh, if we use grpc take um, we can take http2 into account and also benefit from the um, advancements of http2 so we can actually have streams available and open um, to request more data from the server if, if uh, necessary to have basically asynchronous communication with the server all the time if uh, necessary and um, the interface is generated via protobuf so i have one definition and um, all that the clients have to do all the development team have to do is just to regenerate the api based on these proto files and uh, get it running so how is this grpc component created this thing which should take care of all of uh, basically this work for us and that we can basically just plug in into our application maybe import some kind of classes and get grpc2 running so what grpc does is uh, it uses an interface definition language so it has its own specification how the uh, proto files have to look like and the advantage of all of this when we generate uh, basically these uh, protobuf files these pb files is that as a dev basically all i do is i just do function calls everything else is abstracted away from me as soon as i do my function calls the grpc or protobuf will take care of all the rest all the communication for me and in the end i just have a facade for calling all the functions functions which are behind these classes so how does this look like in in practice so let's say i'm building some kind of uh, system where I'm some kind of, let's say, grid operator or infrastructure manager for some train systems. And I would like to add some kind of stations um, or train stations to my system. 
then I can say, okay, I have some kind of service or station service, and it allows me to create stations. So what does a state train station have? Maybe it has a unique geo hash, so I can pinpoint it on the map uh, with some um, single string, which tells me where it is on, on our planet. Maybe there's some kind of operator ID, and maybe train stations are sometimes offline. So our protobuf file gives us the ability to define types for each of my parameters, and I also have to define what is the order of these parameters in the binary which will then be sent and communicated to all the other services. So this is one thing which makes it quite strict and uh, will make it also quite hard if you don't watch out to actually um, extend uh, your models later. So there's uh, dif different ways to make sure that it's extendable and so on. Um, and there's also a problem with uh, coupling sometimes, because what we actually want to do is if we build applications that there should be weak coupling between them, there should not be a strong dependency. However, once we define this kind of interfaces and we don't give it the flexibility necessary, we actually also introduce strong coupling. So this might be a drawback if it's not designed well from the start. However, in these protobuf files, I define the types. When I then generate my types for my specific languages, all these types get translated into the language-specific typing, and uh, we can reuse it uh, in those. So in here, we have this uh, create station service, and we define some types, for example, a create station request. What kind of data does it need? Um, so if I create a station, it says I need a station type, and the station type is defined as something for geo hash or operator ID and online. And what I should get back is I only would like to get something, a Boolean, which says OK or not, or true or not, and maybe a string as well, um, which tells me what kind of error I had. So I cannot count the times with REST API when, diff when I had different REST APIs that give me back some kind of Boolean or expect a Boolean to be entered and you have to always parse a string true or do something else. Um, now, actually, you even get a real Booleans back. So all on, this alone is already amazing. Um, improves a lot of our lives, I think. So what does this protobuf uh, buff do? Um, when we actually want to generate now the classes that we use, uh, we use something protoc, so a protobuf compiler. And uh, the protobuf compiler can give us output in a lot of different languages. So one of the languages, for example, is Python. So it would be just as simple as uh, getting uh, gRPCIO tools, um, where then Python will use the protobuf file and generate Python classes out of the proto definition. In Golang, basically, we use the parameters go out and go gRPC out. So why do we use two? Because we have two different types of things in our protofile. Once we have the type definitions, which are our messages. So what is a create station request? What is a create station response? On the other hand, we also have basically a definition. How should my service look like? So what kind of methods or functions can I call when I implement my service? What can I use as a server? What can I use as a client? So that's why I have basically these two parameters, go out and go gRPC out. So as go out, we can see we see basically a station, operation result, create station request, and so on, um, where we have some links or references to all the classes that we are reusing. And for the gRPC, here we have a station service client and we have a station service server. So basically, the gRPC already defines or gives us the classes um, or the types to use when we want to implement a server or a client. And we already get basically a layout for what kind of methods, what kind of functions we have to implement with that. And um, basically, after that, we are ready to go. We have a template, and we just have to implement it. Um, what else does it provide? So in general, there's a wide range of uh, languages it already provides. And uh, lately, there's been a lot of advancements in uh, gRPC web as well. So there are some improvements there to also use it for web applications, even though um, it's currently it's mostly used for backend services. So this is just a small table to compare. Um, there is a nice site, documentation site by Google, what kind of um, translations for classes you have. Okay, so now we basically quite quickly got to the point that uh, we generate from a proto file different classes, different types, depending on the programming language that we are using. Um, but this, this is something that Swagger can do as well. I mean, there's nothing really special about this. So is this just 
another rest or what what actually is the improvement uh, on this so the improvement comes with the different concepts that grpc gives us and that we can reuse so let's say that we have some kind of uh, microservices talking with, with each other and in general we have different types how services can talk to each other um, we can put all of them in general in four different types so there is a unary rpc um, where you would have basically just one single data being sent and some single data being uh, received however um, when streaming comes in you basically have four different ones so you can stream from the server um, you can continuously send data and the client can request data you could have something where the client is streaming data all the time and the server basically just sends back an okay or sends back one data point maybe just the average of all the data it had received at some point and you have bi-directional streaming so you can have um, communication in both ways um, asynchronously and send data back and forth maybe you build up a, a trading system where you just want to send in uh, loads of prices and you want to get back signals you know and you can do it now in an asynchronous way without having to open multiple connections and tcp connections all the time so how does this look like if you try to put it on in some kind of table so if you have a unary server and um, if you have a client mm -hmm. so it would be either one-to-one -one communication one message in one data point in data out and uh, or the server is streaming data back or in the bi-directional or multiple bi-directional streams you can have multiple streams over one single tcp connection where you send data which might belong to different groups or different areas that you're interested in but you still have the separation out of it so in web sockets for example if you don't use namespaces and so on but you use just uh, web sockets themselves you get an on message right and on error if there's some error in general and everything breaks down but then you get messages in of different types and then you would have to split them up afterwards so here you can have basically streams for every single type that you're interested in and you don't have to pump them all basically for the stream so grpc basically hgp2 takes care of that for you already um yes so what happens or what is the goal usually the goal usually is that in the, on the server side you do the heavy calculations you implement grpc methods you run the calls and on the client side you just implement calling it's uh, sending the data and getting the results back um, all of this as uh, said before is defined in this uh, proto files so how about an example about this? So what do you actually do when you now put everything together and you try to get something running? Um, there is something called CREA, which is a nice um, equivalent of uh, Postman for gRPC, even though I think Postman now supports gRPC as well. Um, however, it, it gives you the possibility to generate example data from the start. So when you connect it to a proto file, it reads basically the layout of your data or the structure, and it can generate fake data for you. So it's very easy to just send data in into your system and, and test it. So um, to set some kind of small project up um, with uh, CREA, let's say that we would like to make a system which all the time gets uh, information about trains and how much delay they have every station they come in, um, just as a small example. So we just set up some kind of proto file where we say that um, we want to calculate a max delay and um, it's an RPC and we have a stream of requests coming in. So we have a stream of numbers just being sent to our service and we have a stream of responses going back, right? So we have a bi-directional communication, bi-directional stream going in, and it's quite the simplest way of defining a proto file. So we have basically two ints getting exchanged um, with each other. So for building this, you only have to call the protoc uh, command, so protoc go out and go out GRP, or go grpc out, and it will generate for you all the go structs and go types. Um, and what, uh, what is among all these things generated is basically this uh, max delay function. And you have a max delay function for the client and you have a max delay function for the server and you, which you have to once implement as a client and as a server. And uh, here as a client to see um, basically a strong point, you actually create a new stream out of it. And then with this stream, you can continuously send in data and listen to data um, that gets uh, generated. So this gets generated by um, basically the, the proto compiler. 
Um, we now start to put together first the server side, uh, which is uh, listening to everything, so the gRPC server. Um, it is, this is a quite simple setup, so you make gRPC new server with no options at all, no security at all, just to get it running. Um, we start it asynchronously, and then we just have some kind of uh, channel um, waiting for some for some kind of interrupt signal to stop it all. Um, so as long as no OS interrupt comes in, this will just keep running. But there is a way now to control it and stop it. Um, we have to implement max delay, of course, because the implementation is not so good, which is given to us. So um, we will create a gRPC server with this implementation. And what do we do? We have basically an endless loop, which is um, taking a few things into account. It uh, checks if there is some kind of context done. So let's say that a context is passed on by the client who connected to us. And for some reason, the connection gets lost or the client aborts the request or anything else. It gets passed on through the context and then we will uh, quit here. Uh, other than that, we will just continuously call the receive function, check if it's end of file. So basically if the client is done, and if not, we just uh, continue. And uh, what do we do? We will um, basically just um, look at the number which is set here. So request sends us a number, and then we just check if the number is smaller or not than max. And if we get a higher number or a higher delay, then we set the new max uh, value. So, and now we go to the client. So we basically do the same thing um, just from the other side. Um, we have all, everything already implemented by the proto compiler. We just have to use it. So in this case, we create a new server and we have here our constructor, new station service client, where we just pass the connection. Um, how do we get the connection? We connect to or we dial now our gRPC server, depending on where our server is listening to. So we set up this one uh, TCP connection. And after that, we can spawn basically servers and we can spawn streams uh, based on this one single connection. And then here, okay, so there is some kind of uh, router here which just listens if there is some kind of request coming in on some endpoint. And if I call the get max endpoint, then I will call basically or make this first connection with our server and start some experiment. Um, so this is what we have to implement. It's the max delay. It might be a little bit small, but I will share the slides later so you can uh, check it if you're interested. So we create some kind of get max delay. So whenever some kind of endpoint or the endpoint uh, max delay is called, we just um, handle it with uh, this function. And what do we do? We get a stream. And this stream we pass to multiple asynchronous functions. So why do we have multiple asynchronous ones? Um, I mentioned before that it, the strong point of these bidirectional streams is that they are asynchronous uh, to each other. They can all go in parallel. And uh, I have three asynchronous uh, Go functions here because one is listening to incoming messages, one is listening or sending out messages, and one is looking for the context. So if my initial context gets aborted or somebody leaves my page, I will also stop this connection because I don't need to continue uh, processing it anymore. So there's just small implementations, so you get an idea what's happening here. Um, let's say this is a this client is running on some kind of train, and somebody always puts up uh, how much delay do I have at the moment, or did it decrease or in, uh, decrease or increase over the last times? So I have just here some kind of random number. You know, I could be five minutes faster or five minutes slower at the next station. And uh, if I'm too fast at the next station, I have to wait. So I will never have negative delay over multiple stations. Um, basically, it be a random walk with a, a tendency to have a higher delay. And uh, I just send it out over the stream. So this basically now sends it out to the gRPC server. And that's it. Um, basically, I just loop through this one uh, 100 times. So this is the sending part. So I handle outgoing messages, and I just continuously do it every 200 milliseconds. While I do this, I also listen to the server. So whenever the server answers to anything I do, um, I have here the stream receive, um, which is the same as stream. Um, I can get messages in and out uh, all the time. 
um, I will just check, okay, um, what kind of response did I get? And if I get some kind of response back from the server, I can now do something with it. In this case, I just make uh, some kind of log message and I log it out. Okay, I send these um, delays and I get a log message from the server out. And the last one is just listening to the context. So whenever the original caller aborts, I want to finish what I was doing and uh, not handle the stream any longer and just exit my function. So we put the server together, we put the client together to handle these kind of uh, bidirectional streams and communicate this information. The server is basically aggregating our values and giving us always uh, some kind of snapshot and information about it. And uh, yeah, now we just have to run it. So we start up um, both our servers, um, or the server and the client. Um, the client is hosting some kind of HTTP endpoint, which uh, I can call. So I call it with uh, curl. And uh, what I get then is, um, so we have to follow now the green lines, um, what happens. So in the beginning, we start the server. So on the server side, I just get a, a max. And then my client starts to send out uh, messages. So all these delays, which got generated automatically, and the server then just compiles the delays and says, what is until now the maximum delay I had? So if you would like to enhance this, would could also have added the name of the station where this delay happened. And then we could write, okay, until now, the station with the highest delay was this and this. And then later, maybe we can do some statistics. Like generally, this is the station with the highest delay and we have to look out for something here. So we send out the messages. Um, now suddenly, a client is sending four and the server sees it and says, okay, the highest value I got is four and sends it back to the client. And the client gets the, it in the stream because it has this asynchronous receive and it prints it out. Okay, at the moment, the highest delay is four. And we continue, send, send, send. And at some point we get to a station with the delay of five minutes. And now we say, okay, the currently highest delay is five. And at some point we finished and we run through, maybe the train arrived at the final destination and it all finished. So just with the curl command, we start all this. Um, both of them exit because the call is over. Um, we went through these 100 iterations. And if I call it again, we would start up a new stream again to have this bidirectional communication between both. So how can we now test it manually, uh, right? Because sometimes I would just would like to check uh, what comes out. And CREA is a really useful tool uh, to do this. So if you start up CREA, um, you get a, some kind of interface which is quite similar to Postman um, that you might have known. And all you need to do is you need to just connect it to your profile. And it automatically identify all the services that you have since it's clearly defined in your profile what the service is. And since it is a stream to stream, a bidirectional stream service, um, what you have to do is you say, okay, I will send my request manually and this will start up a stream. So after you do this, you can send something multiple times and you can basically simulate messages going through the stream again and again without closing the stream. And uh, you do this multiple times and at some point you change the value and you see basically in a response, the new value coming back. And you do this again, lower value, nothing, higher value, you get the higher value back. So basically you have connected yourself into the stream that the server provides you and um, you can we test it manually. And that's all about gRPC in a nutshell. I hope it was a good introduction. And yeah, thanks for listening. Questions? Go ahead. Um, if you generate, so, so you, if you generate the stuff, for example, for Python, um, it's, Probably not that Pythonic because um, the functions are the uppercase. And are there any tags so that you can, or, or you have common case versus snake case and stuff? <laughs> Is uh, there any chance that you find in, in your profile that it, it, it somehow um, pleases the developers on the other side? If you understood the question, can you recap it first so they hear it on the screen? Yes. So the, the question is, if you use uh, protofile proto files and generate uh, Python code uh, with your protofile, is it a 
is it a Pythonic file or not, according to the PEP conventions? Uh, and if not, what kind of um, flags or optional arguments could you give to, to make sure that it's uh, Pythonic? And um, maybe embarrassing, I have never generated uh, files or Python files uh, with uh, proto uh, buff. I don't know if somebody else in the audience has. Um, I'd be curious to know. <laughs> so, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I would imagine, since it's a Python package, um, that it would generate Python files. I mean, there's so many changes that you have to do with. I mean, Python, maybe you don't care about the type so much. Um, but no, uh, still. Yes. But also Visual Studio Code has the automatic change. We should try. Yes. <laughs> More questions? Okay. okay. Good. Then another. Oh, one. Yeah. yeah. Um, since gRPC mostly works on top of HTTP2, uh, are they planning to make use of features of uh, HTTP3 and also quick to? maybe improve on some of its uh, performance shortcomings? I don't know how well you hear in the audience, since gRPC is built on top of HTTP2, what's the plans for reliance on HTTP3, sort mm -hmm. of? Yeah. yeah. I think HTTP3 has no full support until now, or is it already finished? Isn't it still in development? I think quick HTTP3? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know, but I thought it's uh, still, I know that HTTP2 is now fully supported by most big browsers, but still not by all. So I would think that HTTP3 is still a stretch, but I don't know about the plans here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment on timeout? So if you mix unary and stream uh, requests, obviously you write the timeout, like when you define the timeout, you define it for the stream. How do you have any experience in what's a good somehow um, you know, pattern approach? Or compromise? The question yeah. was about timeout in general when it comes to gRPC. Yes, I think it depends on your application because you have to set the timeout in general, anyways, for the applications that you set. If not, you have default timeout. So also for the um, HTTP connections in any library, you have some kind of timeout set uh, where you can run into. So, yeah, it really depends on your application. I don't, yeah, you have to measure how long you expect it to run and then set the timeout. I don't think there's a golden rule for it except um, experience with your application. One last question, maybe? There, yeah. So, in, um, in the rest calls we, we do, we made a connection pool on the transport layer, and we adjust the number of the uh, um, number of the connections there according to our needs. Right? How about in this HTTP two gRPC? Like, do we have a single uh, connection and we use it for everything, or we also maintain a connection pool and um, share the cost across there? Question was about differences between REST and gRPC in handling concurrent connections or having everything in one? Yeah. So let me go back maybe to the, there was a slide about it. So this one. And uh, yes, so the, the point in HTTP2 is that you would like to reuse the same TCP connection. So you don't have to do all the handshakes uh, all the time over again and, ever, and avoid network congestion. So you create basically a server and uh, a client. You have a TCP connection between them. And uh, so anytime you make a new request, for example, through the stream and you receive or you send new data through it, it's not a new connection anymore because you have basically your stream which is kept alive and you don't have to reconnect um, for those requests. If this answers to your question. But you also keep alive the connections with HTTP. 1.1 as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, we, but we keep a um, bunch of connections alive, and then we pick them from the pool and reuse them. So the connections are also kept alive for a long time. You don't open and close connections, right? So that would be very uh, expensive. 
And yes. then the question is down here, in the mm -hmm. HTTP2, do you also maintain such a pool, or do you rather use like one connection and then everything goes to a single connection? Yes, so the, the few advantages in HTTP2, so I think it's more about HTTP2 versus HTTP 1.1, is um, there's few improvements. For example, you don't send the header all the time. The header is, um, how do you say, um, compressed um, basically in, in binary format. Um, you can have multiple streams open now all the time with one uh, TCP connection. That's everything that HTTP 1.1 didn't have mm -hmm. and um, which basically is an improvement there. So yes, in WebSockets um, or HTTP 1.1, you can have multiple TCP connections to try to resolve this problem and use the pool but in http2 for this you would have only really one connection and then just have multiple streams running in parallel in this one connection ben if you have more questions on your mind if there's time after the second talk to ask if patrick is willing in the audience and thanks again patrick thank you uh, I'll just disconnect you, you can, on your browser Go out of the screen, I think. Okay. I'm removing the. Okay, hello. So, if you give us a little bit of time, we'll set up for the next speaker. Um, and we're having a couple of minutes break here, but I'll get you back in max five minutes to just run the show. So, toilet break down to the left, grab a drink, and then we'll go straight to the next. Okay. I will mute.
Okay, so if you're still with us, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Gerald Bauer, who's been giving, I think at least, I can't remember in this meetup, but in my other three meetups, uh, a couple of talks in the past. He's a passionate Golang developer as, long, as well as other programming languages, but I'll leave it to himself to um, introduce. So without further ado, we'll have the last talk for today. Uh, for those of you just joining who saw the program, uh, we had a switch. So Eric Onga is not giving his talk today, but um, ho hopefully in the next one, we're looking into having another meetup already next month. So I'll hand over to Gerald. Yeah, thanks for the hope it's not boring to fill in on. Um, like Go Golang has a fantastic uh, image in the standard library, fantastic image processing. And so I do a pixel art and for pixel art, the portable network PNG uh, is a uh, it, it's built in in the Golang uh, image processing library, and so I do lots of open source and uh, open data and with the blockchain. So I, I stumbled into open art, pixel art, and so if anybody knows the crazy uh, pixel punks. They are uh, 10,000 generated uh, pictures. They are actually, these are the originals. It's a, a PNG file that's less than one megabyte, but it's a $1 billion uh, bitmap. So this bitmap with 10,000 is worth a thousand mil. It's more like this company, you know, that <laughs> it's quoted in New York, <laughs> but this tiny bitmap is making more money yeah, than the than this uh, company with 3,000 people. Because one of these tiny is like, uh, costs yeah, the aliens $50 million for this graphic fine piece of art. <laughs> you see it here, this one is uh, 23 million. <laughs> or this one was just sold September 28th. Or it might be a, what's called a wash trade, you know, you sell it to yourself because there is zero commission and Nobody knows, you know, you can create as many accounts as you like. So anyway, so the crypto crypto banks, not that is my parody so the, or my a little thing for doing crypto banks. Um, and I have a little uh, booklet. It's called Let's Go. Let's Go uh, Pixel Programming. Okay, sorry. What, is it the size? Maybe I do a... He's borrowing my uh, MacBook, and the yes. calling is the other way around, and you cannot control plus. Okay, so that's it. A... It's a little bit of. Okay. Yeah, sorry, a little. So <laughs> let's start. So I have this uh, art base, uh, a web service, uh, and the web service. So Go is fantastic for web services, and it has a fantastic image processing library. So that's, uh, and you get a single binary, which is the art base server. And for this art -based server in Go, it's open source on Pixel Art Exchange on GitHub. So I have like 80, I'm kind of a crazy uh, open source. I have uh, about 80 uh, GitHub organizations. <laughs> and so this Pixel Art Exchange uh, has this art -based server. I can zero click config. And it has uh, the package, the Go package for Pixel Art, which is kind of a, a little wrapper around the Go image processing, especially for uh, PNG graphics, because uh, if you use PNG graphics, they are fantastic for uh, for uh, pixel art because of uh, the the Go uh, image processing language supports every color models and all formats. But for pixel graphics, it's usually you have a bitmap and with our, uh, red, green, blue, alpha, R RGBA uh, for the encoding of the colors and so usually, you know, you, you don't want to deal with uh, all this checking what color model and, and so forth. Anyway, let's start um, for the punks. If you have this uh, bitmap and let's say they are numbered from zero to, to uh, 10,000 to 9,000, and you want to uh, get, you know, you, you bought one of these for millions of dollars. Now you want to get, you know, you want to get your art. <laughs> so you have to, how do you cut it out from this uh, image? So this library, this library, uh, I call it, I call the whole collection a composite image. So if I have this composite image, uh, I just have to supply uh, 
how how big are the tiles? I call it, you know, in, if any does game programming, you have a sprite sheet and or a texture bitmap and the tiles. So because if you request, there was a, uh, the the uh, the question about connection pooling, and if you do a web request, you know, you put all images in one image, and then then you have only one image request. And, but then you have to cut out, you know, the image from the big image from the composite. And so in this case, it's very easy because all the images have the same size. So they are 25 pixel by 25 pixel. So, and if you, anyone wants to do the math, if it's, uh, if one uh, bank is millions of dollars, so what's the price for one pixel? You know, there was a million dollar pixel bitmap, one dollar for a pixel. But here, you know, the most expensive, it's like uh, 900 pixels. And most are transparent; they are not have any color. But it's like ten thousand dollars for one pixel of these. But anyway, so you read the image composite, and then it tells you how big it is, and you can just say punk style zero, and then you save it. You know, more punk zero, and then you have the the PNG in twenty five twenty five. But usually, as you see, these small tiny uh, masterpieces of fine art. <laughs> Nouveau false style or something they call it uh, for uh, like French uh, primitives or whatever. And but you want to make it bigger. So that's built in into the uh, library. You can say zoom. And if you do zoom, usually if you if you zoom into a photograph, it, it, uh, it doesn't do uh, uh, doesn't work for pixel art, because if you zoom a, a pixel art, you want to have uh, it's called uh, near near border or closest color uh, scaling, which is not usually the default for image libraries. But so in, in this case, the wrapper makes it really easy. So if you want to have a forty four x or ten x whatever, so this is the four x size, and then of course one pixel is multiplied by four, and you can zoom, you know, ten size. 10x or whatever, that's uh, how easy it is. And so, you know, you know the deal now with Go modules, you know, you just, if you compile this example, you do the Go mod modules in it, and then you get the, the pixel art package, which is part of the art base uh, uh, repository and Go run main. And so this would be, uh... <coughs> and now, you know, the fun is you can make your own unique art <laughs> so the one easy part is to change the, the background is transparent by default so you can use uh, as background you know use a different color that's the official uh, larva grayish uh, background which is just the uh, archie red green blue hex code but you can also use the css uh, color names and so um, to show some solidarity, you know, there is a war in Europe. And so I have the, the punks, you know, you can change the background uh, to uh, Ukraine. I think I have it actually uh, uh, built in that you don't have to supply the, the colors. You can just say Ukraine and it does, you know, it changes the background to the colors official. Or you can silhouette means that you make uh, make just uh, an outline and uh, of course who cares about punks yeah gophers are more fun <laughs> and there's actually there's a, there's a uh, Egon Elbrus Govas collection which what year is it two years ago or five years ago so he has this fantastic pixel art and believe it or not it's 32 by 32 pixel <laughs> you know that's yeah. it's xxxl size and so, but of course, there are only how many other 35 gophers with different expressions, and it's 14 kilobytes, you know. And so you have this gophers image. And if you want to get the individual, so that's the whole collection. And this collection, I think, is free. It's public domain, you know. It's the the artist has has donated it. He didn't sell it, but it's free. And so, um, how do you do it? So the changes 32 by 32 is the, the point, the title size, and then it tells you know the, the how big is the uh, 
and you can just um, again start saving and change the background and so on and so forth. But now to, to wrap up, let's do the 10,000, let's do inside the magic man machine, let's do 10,000 unique punks. We recreate them from scratch. And the magic formula is, this is genera generative pixel art, which means they are using this tiny building blocks. This is 20 by 20 uh, uh, PNGs and you, you merge them on top of each other. So if you have a bunk, you have, they are the, the, the faces, though so there's male one, two, three, four, for the different skin types. There's the super rare aliens, you know, and then you can make aliens never before seen, you know, you just name top hat or a, a pilot a helmet or whatever, and you put it on the alien, yeah? and you have a masterpiece, you know, millions of dollars, you yeah? know, super rare, never before seen. And it's like if anybody's playing the lottery in Austria, six out of 45, the magic is only 45 numbers, you know, and you just have to get six, you know, and you are a millionaire. And so how, do, why does it not work that you get a millionaire? Because there are so many combinations, yeah? And then six out of 45. And here you have only, you have only 122 attributes. But anyone guess how many combinations you can make of unique punks with 100, with 100 uh, attributes? So it's about a billion, you know? It's, I think it's not eight, eight billions for all the whole world, but or it might be, you know? It's, but it's at least uh, thousands, thousands of millions of unique uh, punks that you can create. And so, and they have, they have uh, that's the part, you know? Now it is, it's fashionable to have artificial intelligence and you give it a text prompt and uh, the machine learning uh, generates the image. And so this is a simple version with no machine learning. So you give it, uh, you can give it uh, in the last example, you can give it the text where you say a female one big spike and, uh, and uh, air shades and it generates your punk. Oh, I think I have it already here. Yeah. So that is the, the generic bank. You give it uh, bank number zero. It's female two, earring, blonde, bob, green, eyeshadow. And then it generates the PNG image. You can save it in the original format or 20, Zoom 20 is 20X. And then you, you save, you know, male, smile, mohawk. It's the next masterpiece. That's how they, are, they get generated. And that's the, the magic formula is, uh, I normalize the, the text, you know, female three, I replace all, all, I replace all uh, white spaces and two lowercase and the generate bank. So that's uh, how easy it is, you know, you, you pass in the, the attributes, the values. The first one is the, the face and then you just loop over the, uh, the you loop over the values. Oh, here's the, the loop. And the important part is this magic is the punk paste. So punk is the, the image. And if you paste the attribute, which is just another image, the trick is the trick is as in animation invented by, uh, I think uh, by Star, Star Wars, Star, no, that the, the background is transparent. So if the background is transparent, you can put, you know, one, uh, one, image on top of each other. And if they are, you know, set up that way, then you can easily compose. And it's named in this case, paste for copy paste. That's, uh, and that's, that's really, you know, let's test drive that's here, pixel art, generate bank, save, and 20X. So that's, you know, you can, of course, that is the size female, uh, male one with the mohawk, the bank, and it has this, magic smile, <laughs> which is one pixel, you know, 3D, 3D glasses. And of course, uh, 10,000, how does it work? You know, I have made it easy. There is the Punk's uh, CSV data set. That is, uh, has, um, there is a maximum. There's only one Punk with seven attributes. And there, so attributes are these accessories. And so these are the 10,000 in CSV uh, format. 
that's uh, you know in Excel or whatever, and you, you can okay because sorry yeah it's kind of big. 10,000, it might be, you know, almost uh, 800, like a megabyte or something, yeah? Not so big, 800K. Sorry, that was not good to click on this one. No worries. We just have to wait. It's not a joke, man. Right? <laughs> and so, but if you see, um, yeah. So the punk CSS EV, and all you have to do, I think, um, this, it's built in, the uh, read CSV, uh, the the standard the go go standard library has the CSV uh, library built in, and so read CSV, comma separate uh, values, ten thousand punks, and then of course you do just the, the loop, and you generate the the whole uh, uh, punks. So then you as output you get punk zero and twenty x or something you know, or whatever size, and that's how it looks. You know, this are all the the original, and now you have, you know, that's not a copy, you know, you have generated the the million dollar banks, you know, a white label from scratch, you know, it's not right click and save, but they are actually, you know, generated from from source. And then, of course, how to, as a bonus to wrap up, yeah, how can you put them all into one, uh, into one uh, image? Then uh, this pixel art has the new image composite, and you say, you know, 25 by 25, and the grid is 100 by 100, which gives you uh, 10,000 bunks. And then you just generate the bunk, and you say bunks in this case is the, the big image, and you add one of the other one, and then uh, you can save the bunks. And now, you know, if you remember this one here, Was it, uh, yeah, this is the original, it's Lava Labs Mega Metron. Uh, this is the uh, Met Hall Met Met from New York. So this is the image here with 828, and this is the pixel perfect white clean room uh, copy generated safe that I have here. If I open it, it's not a copy. You know, I didn't copy it. It is actually generated from scratch. Okay, I see it is a little bigger, <laughs> but it, it's still a small uh, PNG because it's 8 bit. So it is using, if anybody is in graphics, it's using in for storing uh, index. So the colors are indexed by one, two, three. So that makes the, the, the make, makes it smaller. Yeah. And to wrap up, the last one is. I did this, uh, so the pixel art package, as you remember, was part of this uh, art based server, microservice. But if anybody knows this art in the corner, this is Mona Lisa with a virtual reality, uh, <laughs> with a virtual reality uh, metaverse glass were <laughs> never before seen, unsold. And uh, yeah, here's the the Go Artbiz server, and it has this is the the pixel the source for the this is the source for the the you've seen the source for the pixel art package. And the ArtBase server actually is using a, a microservice which has this collection. And then you can see uh, that's how it gets used. You know, you can see punk uh, zero and it has in cache the big composite image in small size. And it provides you, you know, you can get the pictures. And as a service, it you can add um, instead of PNG, you can add SVG, vector graphics. And then you get it uh, as vector graphic. That, that bitmap, but of course, how does it work with the SVG? It's every pixel because they're small. Every pixel is going to get converted to a rectangle, and then you can scale it. You know, SVG is stacks, and there are all this. If you know this collection, and then you know can play around. There's the zoom. There was this uh, what have a built in, and of course it's single. And Heroku is going to shut down the free tier or something. 
but I think this one is still working. So I have, in this case, I have 38 collections. You have seen the, the, the punks, and I can show you, uh, this was the punk. What is a fun one? Uh, let's try the, the punk rocks <laughs> are funny ones. Well, let's do the, the rocks first, you know, how silly it is. The rocks, of course, is, uh, you know, oh, yeah. these are the funny ones. How much? Two million dollars, you know. Amazing. What can you do with the rock? It's a rock. But, you know, it's... <laughs> and so somebody came up that with a punk rock. And the punk rock joke is basically... Uh, sorry, where's this? I don't think you opened the punk rock. Oh, the, I need the, the, the overview. Oh, here's the, the punk rock. Uh, so the, they are funny, you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> they have this, uh, they have uh, in different color and there's an alien punk rock, you know, with the uh, Corona medical mask and with the knitted hat. <laughs> <laughs> but they, it's a small collection sold out. Another funny one is the, <laughs> If another funny ones, and of course you can download, you know, if you click here, you have the whole collection. Another funny one is uh, Dodge, of course. And there, there's the, the Dodge, uh, the Dodge punks. Actually, these are, is, is my collection in case, I, I mean, I didn't do the original one, but I did the 25, 24 picks version. And so there's, uh, this, there's a sprite sheet for this one to generate from source, but the Dodge one is a great, a funny one. And so maybe a last one is, might be the, for the crypto brothers, is the fast food McDonald's. You need a, a job. I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I'm kind of, uh, okay. Yeah, so thanks. Let's do the, the uh, fast food. Yeah, that's fast. The Moonbirds, if anybody knows. And of course, there are hundreds of these um, board apes in pixel version. Okay, this is maybe the board apes, cool kids. But yeah, these are, and if anybody knows, I have a service called, as a joke, it's called um, right click and save this. Because the art base, so there's the art base server, but there is the art base tool, which it lets you back up. Uh, crypto art collections, which is automating the right click and save. And then it can generate these composites. And sorry, so I, 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 as last one, I show you this channel. If I get to this page, I have to get to the pixel art uh, GitHub page. There's too many tabs. Collections. Yeah, maybe crypto collections. Okay, I, I closed this, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Okay, I, I type in pixel art exchange, sorry. Pixel art, get back to this one. Yeah, so I have this. Uh... Oh, here it is. 